blessed, man. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, this is a little web series I'm doing called Breaking Bread, where um, it really started off by kind of going through this MBA process. I've, I've met some dope ass people, including yourself, who are doing some really crazy things. And obviously people are like in these traditional routes, which is, you know, all cool and, 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 and whatnot, but it's really um, eye opening and inspiring when you meet some people who are just doing stuff that's like out of the norm that um, as you kind of alluded to um, in our discussions with recruiting at NYU, like you had to do it on your own pretty much. Like you were doing your own kind of way where everybody else was kind of doing the traditional consulting and finance and um, CPG and whatnot. So um, the, really the premise is just to bring more people to the fold. Um, and so with that, um, thank you. And so for those of you who don't know, this is Silas Gaines. He's the CMO of Slash Sports Entertainment. Um, my guy went to, to USC undergrad, NYU business school. So, um, you know, kind of kick it off. Like what, how did you, how did you guys kind of, you know, start Slash Sports Entertainment? Like what was the premise behind it? Um, and we can kind of go from there. Um, man, so my brother, when he was coming to the end of his college playing career, so he started off at University of Pennsylvania, then transferred to UC Riverside. So he was coming to his final year. He was kind of just like, man, what, what does he want to do next? And he got involved with a sports agency, started interning that my AAU coach had a relationship with. So he started interning with them. And he decided like that's what he wanted to do professionally. And just so happened that time when he was finishing up his playing career, I was um, in my senior year of high school. And I just so happened to fall into figuring out that I had a heart condition. So I had to stop pooping. And I had came into that junction myself. Like I right, hoop is, is done. What do I want to do? And I've always like looked up to my brother and seen what he was doing on the business end of, of basketball was something that intrigued me. And I've always like really been super interested in like the business side, especially on the grassroots end. Um, just growing up within that system, like my brother played for shoe sponsor teams. I played for shoe sponsor teams coming up. So I was always surrounded by um, that, that business aspect of it from an early age. So um, I wanted to go and join him into like the sports side of the business. I, and originally I wanted to do like financial advising for, for athletes because I was interested in like how money works. So I ended up getting my undergraduate degree in finance at USC. But um, yeah, going into college, we just kind of came up with a plan like I, right, I'm going to go and intern and figure it out on my end. He's going to keep doing what he was doing on his end. And at some point we were going to come together and then start a company. Yeah. And we came, well, my brother came into a, a unique and, and good situation with, with the balls um, when he was fresh out of law school, concluding law school, that allowed us the opportunity to just start our own business a lot earlier than we expected. Yeah. So having the number two pick, it really just, you know, allowed him the opportunity to start, start a shop from the jump rather than going to work somewhere. So he started Slash. And then um, I was about to be, I was graduating undergrad at the time. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna come join him. So I went and worked at UTA for a year, kind of a year and a half to get a feel for what it is working at an agency. Then went and did my MBA and then now I'm full time with the company. Um, so that's kind of like how it all happened. You know, long story short, not, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, that's dope. And uh it's crazy that he didn't have to go through like that traditional route. I'm sure you experienced maybe at UTA, but I remember when I was looking at the MBA process and I was talking to some agencies, they were like, yeah, you got to start the mail room. Like no matter if you get an MBA or, um, you know, a, a, a doctorate degree or anything like that, you got to start in the mail room. Um, but I know he busted his ass to kind of get that opportunity. So that's, that's really, really unique. Um, how, how was your experience at UTA? Like, what did you feel like you kind of gathered from there that you kind of brought over to, to Slash? So being at UTA is the third largest talent agency in the world. So you're seeing an entertainment agency work at the at the highest level. So we were a super boutique at, at the time, but still, you know, very boutique currently. But to be able to see how the whole operations of an agency like that 
work, um, you know, from the mail room all the way to, you know, the top to the top of the top and just seeing all the, the deal flow is one of those um, jobs, especially when you come in as a trainee, like I did, and you get onto a desk, you're learning through osmosis, like you're literally just thrown into somebody's business and you're learning through phone calls and emails. So you have to just sit there and kind of just digest everything that's going on um you know day after day you're working like you know 11 hour days and if you have a really good agent that you're on the desk of you're probably you know seeing like 10 or so deals a week right. you know and just to be able to see that volume of of deals is is just different yeah and that was a uh, second like Prior to my MBA, that was another type of graduate education in in business, uh, specifically in in the entertainment business. So I think being able to have that was, I think, very instrumental into what we're doing now, because I was just able to see how this works at a different level. And also, it was cool that UTA wasn't didn't have sports at the time, yeah. uh, because the sports business is, is kind of specific. And they have their own way of doing business that is a little bit different than the structure of music, movies, television, um, like they had like books, um, digital. So being able to see how they kind of structure everything in a way, like sports is, is almost like the wild, wild west and kind of like how the business structure is, like how people do business. Um, so being able to see it just exclusively on the more traditional entertainment in I think it was good as well it gave me a, a more of a diverse perspective on you know the sports entertainment business and to be able to bring that way of of doing business I think has has served as well on the sports side right just like it's into like all right this is just how we do it in sports it was like, oh well you know this is a different way to kind of do things and I think that's also with the NBA with the NBA seeing how you know, SaaS companies are doing business and, you know, consumer products companies are doing business. You see all these different types of industries and be able to take the similarities and then um, kind of, you know, transform it to the sports industry. Right. So where UTA was just a huge benefit. It was just like, man, it's just, it's talent agency at the highest level possible. Right. Um, able to take that experience and then bring it to what we're doing on a boutique level I think was something that was very important and definitely something I would do again even though you know being on the desk and being an assistant and shit but I, I would definitely <laughs> eat it. I think it was very important to what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing in the future for sure and I'm sure some of that those skills were transferable so like kind of looking back or like you know maybe looking forward to like why did you get an MBA and, and why NYU specifically? Because um, you didn't really take a break either. I don't know if we kind of mentioned that, but you didn't take a break between, or really a big break between um, undergrad and MBA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I love New York. I just, it's just something about New York, man. It's the energy, the people, everything. I just always had an infatuation with New York. Growing up, my favorite basketball player was Sebastian Telfair. So, hey, Lincoln. Yeah, facts, facts. So I always wanted to, to just live in New York. So when I was an undergrad, I got a random like sponsored email, like message, LinkedIn message from uh, NYU admissions from Stern telling me about this thing. They had a Berkeley scholarship, which they give to about five students who just finished undergrad to be able to go straight into their MBA. So I was like, oh shoot, that's dope. I always wanted to kind of get my, I knew I wanted to go get my MBA at some point, but I was aware that I need to like, you know, work three to five years, you know, what they say and all that. Um, so I didn't think it was like gonna be immediately attainable. When I saw that, I was like, oh, that's, that's a cool opportunity. Um, so I applied, got it. The only school I applied to got it, was surprised. <laughs> but it, I, I applied during the, the final um, round of admissions and like in the spring in March. And it just so happened that year that a lot of people, um, Ex like accepted their their admissions so they were basically full so they gave me an opportunity to defer for a year go work and then come in the following year so i did that 
So I had that, I basically had like one year break that time at, at UTA. I was like interning there full time prior to like my, my spring semester. So um, just went and just ended up going there as a full time employee after I graduated. And then yeah, um, just like the, the decision to get an MBA is just, it's just the ultimate business education. I was like in a classroom setting, like you could always learn business by doing, but being able to get that in a classroom setting. And I know so, and I would always like read like Forbes and read about different people. And they talk about like MBA from Columbia, MBA from Harvard, you know, all these things like that. So I was like, oh, this, this is, I feel like something that must be useful or almost necessary to propel yourself in the business world. So that's why I made it a point to like, I'm gonna I'm try to go get my MBA. And I think New York, beyond just me loving the city, I, I think it was a perfect place because it's just like, there's so many industries in New York and especially when it comes to media entertainment, like it's the, it's the media capital right. and just have so many diverse set of businesses. You have the finance industry, you know, tech is moving in over there. Um, sports has a strong presence, obviously. Uh, it, it, it was, it was just perfect. And then even when I got there, even more so being able to see all the young black professionals, that was something I was even hip to. Like, I didn't even think it was going to be that many black professionals, young black people out there going and getting to it. Like in LA, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different vibe as far as like people quote unquote working, like if they work and they doing something, you don't really know what they doing, but they live in the job, but you don't know necessarily how how they afford in the lifestyle. Okay. Um, New York is 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 different. Like everybody's hustling, everybody's you know trying to improve themselves, trying to you know rise in the ranks in their career. So being around that energy and just meeting so many young black people who was on that same wavelength I was, I mean, I think that was that was something that was invaluable that I didn't even expect. That was probably the greatest part low key about being out there like meeting somebody like yourself like just being out at a, at a pop-up shop like yeah. like that's a it was a fashion pop-up yeah so i mean stuff like that like anywhere i would go out i'm meeting somebody like random even like women like i would i would date like yeah i work at bank of america i'm at goldman sachs it's just like wow <laughs> like it, it, it was just different um so yeah, that's why I just think like the, the NBA, like going into it, there was reasons why I wanted to do it. And then once I got there and started doing it, it was just even more things like from the city of New York to the Stern itself that just made it an unparalleled experience and something that I think just has, has really changed my trajectory um, going into this business world or continuing in this business world. Yeah, I feel you on that too. and and kind of what you talked about by UTA, like, I feel like first the MBA process, and I'm sure even New York City was like an osmosis process too, right? Where like, that's the reason why I moved back to New York after living in Georgia for some time. It just feels like not many people have just one hustle. Uh, yeah. Always got multiple hustles. Uh, yeah. What they're doing from the five to nine is, is crazy. And those pop-up shops, I mean, you always meet in a mixture of people. It's not just people who are in the arts. You can have somebody in finance, you can have somebody in DC or, you know, sports or wherever it may be, all in the same place, just vibing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what, what, what things did you, were you able to kind of tap into while you were in um, New York and at NYU that, you know, you think kind of pertain to like what you're doing now? Um, man, I would say from NYU um, perspective, I took a lot of like, my, my final year, I took a lot of um, like real world consulting classes. So NYU offers, this is one of the luxuries of also being like in a major city like New York. And like I was saying, having all these companies there, they're able to like partner with them to be able to do these live, basically what they call live case studies. Um, so I did a, a cool couple ones, did one with Spotify. I did another one with a brand called OXO, consumer products brand. Um, did another one with a, with a startup um, based out of New York, a media entertainment startup. Did another one with um, Hearst, the Hearst Corp Corporation, working with their um, women's lifestyle um, division. 
So just like those four, like two of those being super major companies, another one being like a, a good mid-sized company, another being a startup, like that range of work of, of type of companies as far as like in their, their size and in their, their life cycle, um, that was something that was, that was super, super big. Yeah. Um, do you know being at being at NYU and especially for somebody like me who didn't have an extensive work experience um I mean I did and stuff internships and stuff like that in college but to be able to have 12 15 week projects working directly with Spotify you know and working on a case for them and presenting that the presentation skills you get from that going to the offices presenting these things um that's that was something that was super big and gave me uh help help really work my my business muscle like you know help help me think differently about different problems that businesses are facing um it gave me a diverse set of problems to to have to solve you know in sports you're especially in the sports agency business it's you have a specific type of thing that you you're working on you know you're dealing with clients but you know it's it's you, it's not always as a diverse set of things that 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 come to the table you right. know so being able to to work on those those cases for those for those companies it allowed me to to solve problems that I wouldn't necessarily always face in my my day-to-day -day profession and um, I think it also, in thinking and in, in doing that, it, it allowed me to think a new, a new way. So now coming into what we're doing with Slash, I'm thinking about different things that we can do from the stuff I was seeing with Spotify, stuff I was seeing with, with Hearst, stuff I was seeing with OXO, and um, being able to, you know, come up with more unique ways to, to revamp things that we're doing on, on the sports end, particularly yeah. on yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. So like, you know, as you kind of like, you know, think about your experience at NBA and now you're you know, back to full time with the sports agency, like, what do you feel like are some misperceptions that people have about the sports representation industry? Um, I think some of the misconceptions they may have is that it's like, uh, I would say probably that they think all agents are kind of like grimy, things like that. Um, you know, kind of how agents just have like a negative, it has a negative connotation to it, to be, to be an agent. Um, so but then, something or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people that are like that and definitely, you know, within the business, it's, it's a dog eat dog world, but it's a service business at the same time. So we're here to, to, to service clients. Um, and I think that's like one of the, the bigger misconceptions um, that people are not in it for the right reasons. I mean, I've met some people that are really, you know, trying to do this because they really love basketball and they really want to help out these, these basketball players. I um, mean, I feel like most people do it because of that. I mean, they maybe get lost in the way and like in earning money and all the other stuff that goes along with trying to, attain clients you know you could kind of get lost in the path but i think at their core you know they're doing it for the right reasons i think another misconception is that it's hard to break into it's hard but it is not hard at the end of the day because um all you need is a player like case in point with us like we had lonzo um and we was able to start a business i mean it's hard to get a number two pick um Super hard. I mean, we're trying to <laughs> another one. You know, it's difficult. Uh, but the thing is, if, if you can get one, you can start you can start a business. And that's the thing about like the difference between like entertainment and basketball. And basketball, they have to draft 60 people. Right. And if you're in the draft, man, if you a turtle and you the person representing that number one pick, they gonna do business with that turtle. They got like, it. <laughs> no choice but to do business with whoever is representing that that young man whereas in entertainment if this actor is getting nominated by i'm mean, getting um represented by 
this random person, they they like, oh, well, there's more actors. Like you, you have more spots. It's more easily to find replacements. Yeah. But in, nah, it's like, man, this is a this is a once in generation talent. You go and talk to whoever you got to talk to. I see. Like, <laughs> dig up somebody to talk to. You go and talk to that person because, you know, they got to win games. And if you think this is the person, you know, going to help you win games, you got to talk to whoever you got to talk to. Right. It's, it's a different. So that's why I think people feel like, man, it's just super hard to break into the industry. And I mean, it is, especially if you're trying to go work at an agency, it's tough because it's just like, it's not like investment banking. They're not hiring 120 people every year. Right. Uh, but if you want to just start your own thing, man, hey, just go find the next Zion and build a relationship. And if he rock with you and he signed with you, you got a business. Simple as that. It's, it's simple, but it's not simple. You know, it's one of those things. I feel you on that. And I think one, one thing you told me too is like the the startup cost too. I've heard a little bit about that. Can you talk about like like what it might cost? Not you don't have to give any specific numbers, but like from from when they leave school to like that training camp session, like how you train them up into a draft, and then once they get drafted, like there's got to be some type of cost that's involved with that as well, right? Yeah, um, pre-draft pre-draft is your is your largest expense by far. Uh, when it comes to this business, I mean, you probably had two sets of major expenses. It's going to be pre-draft and then like travel to go recruit. Um, but yeah, pre-draft, yeah, that it, it could get expensive, especially if you sign a lot of guys. Um, and if you have top level guys, as we know with professional athletes and with any person of, you know, feels they have some status, you know, there's egos that mm -hmm. become, you know, grow. So dealing with that, you know, in college they was eating ramen, and then now you know they know they about to come into a a, a couple of bags. They like, nah, they ain't they ain't messing with ramen no more. Yeah, you know, it's the taste, and you're the person that has to satisfy, you know, those expensive tastes. You know, when it be, when it's pre draft time. So it just all depends. I mean, that's one of the things you gotta really figure out on your from your cost perspective is managing pre-draft in a way where it's not going to break the bank because if you have sure fires you know like man i got five lottos at the least they're going to go mid late first i mean you can you can drop those pre-draft expenses because you know you're going to recruit for the most part right um, but you know sometimes when you're dealing with second round picks fringe guys you know they want to be trained so if you're going to train them, um, pay for their training and things like that, set them up, especially if it's somewhere remote or some different from where they like reside, say to go to Iowa State, their trainings in Los Angeles, you got to pay for, you know, them, the lodging, you know, meals, transportation, training, recovery, all those types of things, you know, that, that adds up. And if you don't know if they're going to get drafted, that that could be tough, you know. You kind of have to weigh the the cost benefit analysis because you know even if they do get drafted, they may not end up getting because second round, you know, it's not guaranteed. May not get a guaranteed deal, or they go, you know, they just get a two way deal, and you're not really making nothing off that until that second deal. So you in the you in the red for a little bit. <laughs> so that's, that's where it gets tough. Yeah. So, so you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, like what, what was the buzz like uh, when you guys um, were asked to be, to represent the Ball Brothers? Like um, at, at that point, I think he was, your brother was relatively unknown in the sports scene. For, for, for yeah. Part. So like, what was that, that atmosphere like uh, for you guys? It was crazy. I mean, my brother had been on it for a while. So since my since Lonzo was a sophomore, he had been building a relationship with LeVar, the family. So I had seen it, you know, cultivated for a long time for a lot of other people. You know, when it dropped, they was just like, oh, shit. <laughs> it, it, it was crazy. It was honestly crazy. I mean, he at that time, he was, I mean, the amount of media attention around that family was heavy. Was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Probably nothing it's probably n never been anything like that. I mean, you've had people like Braun who's like crazy talents, but like, I don't know if it was 
to the degree of the ball family just because of the fact of like social media and all that yeah. is going on now um but yeah the the attention was wild i mean i don't know how many people hit them up for interviews yeah. all like it, it was it was a lot to be thrown at the brother you know at the age of 28 28 that's crazy 28 so it was a lot especially if that's your your first go it, it was it was for sure a lot so i mean i was kind of from like the outside looking in i was very close to the situation but i wasn't hands-on direct in the representation of you know lonzo or the other two brothers that was you know mainly my brother and i was at uta at the time um but yeah it, it was crazy it, it was definitely crazy i mean he was on a reality show <laughs> like say yeah that was on facebook right or no yeah yeah facebook reality show like it, it was so much and then just to be like being in uta and i'm in the bathroom hearing these agents talking about lonzo and Melo, and i'm just like damn that's wild like <laughs> <laughs> and they created their own brand too i mean People was kind of flacking them at the same time as like, nah, they actually have the curve. Like they understand what's going on in this whole shoe deal and, and, and apparel. Um, yeah. Yeah, honestly, I, uh, I mean, they had the right idea. They had the right idea. Maybe wasn't the, the greatest execution, but they had the right idea. And I think it's one of those things where it's going to put that nugget into somebody else's mind right. and then from what they did and then they're going to execute it in, in a better way but like shoot i remember when my brother first told me like yeah they they gonna make a shoe i was like what like i remember that day like <laughs> i thought it was crazy at the but then the more i thought about it i was like man they kind of right just kind of like how shooters are structured i mean they they give you a lot of money but they lock you in like it's a lot of exclusivity mm -hmm. that's involved in that and to be able to have that that flexibility to be able to be able to do apparel, shoes, all these other things, all these other categories, um, I think was and to have ownership in it, I think, man, it it was smart. Somebody somebody is gonna do it again. I mean, Spencer Dinwiddie, he kinda got something like that going on. But I mean, somebody else is gonna do it and it's gonna really work. It's gonna shake stuff up even more. For sure, for sure. I mean, you saw like the D Way go to that Asian company with Lee Ning. Um, yeah. Thompson did some too. So it's kind of like these people are kind of realizing, like, you know, it's not all going to come from Nike and Adidas. They're going to have to kind of do some other strategic opportunities on their own too. Yeah. Um, you know, I know Brandon Jennings kind of started it, but then, you know, LaMelo going to overseas and playing, not going to college, I think was it was a huge thing too. So um, yeah. I definitely admire that family, what they, what they were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So kind of a speaking about like overseas, um, you know, it seems like kind of like y'all's player portfolio was a lot of overseas players. Like how did that kind of, that kind of play out? Like what was y'all's thought process behind international versus um, domestic players? Um, so, I mean, our first client was actually Jamal Franklin. It wasn't even Lonzo. We started our business with Jamal. That's been, one of our closest friends since I was yay high. He, we were all from the same city. Him and my brother went to high school together. He played for my dad's AAU program growing up. Like, that's like our brother. So we started the business with Jamal, like, and he's been with us, you know, ever since. And he got drafted by the Memphis Grizzlies, like in the early, early mid second, early, like, yeah, early second round. I think he was like 41st pick, yeah. uh, played with the Nuggets. And then, you know, he found a lane in China and he's been making great money. He actually just re-signed to his team. Um, got a got a re-up, got another one year for like one point something, two, something like that. Got a multi-year deal, multi-million dollar deal. Um, so we had him and so overseas pay, like he's one of the highest paid players in in over overseas. So when you got a guy like him, it's able to attract a lot of other great overseas talent. You know, what we bit they saw the job that we've been able to do with him. And Jamal's been a great spokesperson for us, you know, and we've been able to land a lot of great guys like, you know, Jabari Brown, man, Isaiah Austin, George King, 
Perry Jones, Xavier Thames, you know, we got we got a long list of guys who are well respected, you know, in this game of basketball. They may not be in the league, but you know, throughout the league beyond, cats know their names and they know the work that they've done and they know that they still nice. Right. So that's one of the things that for us, we was just like you know, NBA, is it's hard to get league dues. It's hard to get league dues. And, you know, we're still a young company. And we'll, we'll get more. But how we saw it was, man, we just want to represent Cats who nice. Simple as that. Like, we're basketball guys. Like, I got – I feel like me and my brother, we got PhDs in basketball. Right. Like, and, you know, true to – who we are, like, you know, we want to represent dudes who we think are nice. And all these dudes who we represent, we think they're cold. And that's base, that's the basis of how we recruit. It's like, you cold? We want to rock with you. I word. <laughs> got a long list of clients. You know, we got 30-some dudes who are all cold. And they just all happen to play overseas right now. And that's just what it is. So, I mean, our recruitment strategy is, man, we think you nice and we rock with you as a person. Man, join the family. That's what's you know, up. Our criteria. So that's that's just how we we got you know along. Our our client list is majority overseas dudes. Just just so happens that they they play overseas. But yeah, those are real killers. And what what, what do you feel like is like the biggest markets for overseas? Um, I know China, and I think I'm thinking like Turkey maybe. Or what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean any of the teams that compete. The countries that compete in the Euro League, um, but like yeah, Turkey, Germany, Israel, um, France, Italy, um, China pays well. Competitively, is not as strong as some of the aforementioned um, European countries. But yeah, I would say yeah, like Turkey, Germany, um, Italy, France, Israel pretty strong leagues yeah and so how have you got as you guys have been kind of exposed to this international game do you feel like you guys are kind of going to branch out from basketball to like, like some other sports or do you feel like you're going to kind of stay in the basketball lane for now um we're sticking with basketball for now i mean i think there definitely will be opportunities in the future to branch out you know it's just not there yet we'll see um but you know we only three years into this basketball stuff. So we really trying to establish here first, make sure we got a strong foothold, build up some market share. And then from there, think about expansion. But for right now, we just focused on who. Yeah. And so I know you kind of talked about your strategy about just finding players that just cold. Um, but, you know, a part of it too, I think I was kind of looking at y'all's site and just some discussions from you. It seems like, like, how do you, how do you differentiate you got your, yourselves from like other agencies? And I think, from my understanding, it's, it's kind of building off not just being a good player, but, you know, life after basketball, like investing in, in generational wealth. Yeah, I mean, all those things. We just want them to use the sport of basketball as a vehicle to create, you know, wealth for generation. I mean, that's the main thing. And however that is accomplished, whether it's by building brands, investing, whatever it may be, philanthropy, um, just having an impact, you know, is, is, the, is the main part, just being impactful. That's what we really, you know, predicate ourselves on. And I mean, as far as like differentiating ourselves, to be honest with you, it's, it's hard to differentiate yourself in, in, this, in this business. If you go and look at 20 to 25 different agencies, they all gonna say the same thing on their website as far as what do they do. Yeah. It's just, there's only so many things you can do in this business as far as like the servicing part. You can, you know, be excel at one specific thing. Like, you know, say Zappos, for instance, Zappos, how they differentiate is on service. They go above and beyond. You can be the agency that like, we're just, give you the most exemplary service and that's where we win but there's no agency that really like does that i mean nobody figured it out where you differentiate in this business is having more players honestly like the more players you have the more power you have right i mean it's just as simple as that and then once you get to 
a certain level of power, you know, once you up there with like the CAAs and like big sales, um, when now what clutch is at, it's you all just powerful, everybody powerful. So and there, there's not much where they could differentiate this themselves. Um, I mean, I saw that at UTA, there's not much of a difference between UTA and CA and WME. I mean, some, but I mean, that's why you see actors and yeah, they go all throughout those three because it ain't that much of a just like, do I, it comes down to, do I really rock with these people? Right. I think where you really are able to differentiate yourself. It's just like, man, do I like this person more than the next person? You know, it's, it's, it's a courting process. It's like dating. It's, you know, do we like each other more than we like the other person? And I think that's where it comes down to a, a lot of times uh, with players picking agencies, you know, when it's equal as far as like what they feel like they can do on a business level. You know, sometimes they feel like uh, one agency can do more from a business perspective, so they'll go with them. Um, but I feel like if those two are equal, it's going to go based off like who I have a better relationship with or who's paying the most attention to me. Like, do I feel like I'm, I'm being um, serviced, you know? Yeah, things like that. So yeah, it's, it's one of them business. That's why it's, it's a tough business because it's like, how can you really differentiate yourself? Like, it's tough. That's why it's so, so relationship-based. But it's a good perspective though. I mean, you know, I think, from the outside looking in, you see people consistently jumping from place to place and you're always wondering like, what's in it for them that they decided to make that switch? Is it just a, you know, a relationship gone awry or is it just like, yo, I just rock with this person with this person or, you know, they may have given me an opportunity I, I couldn't see at this one. So um, it's definitely an interesting perspective to share. Yeah. Um, you know, so kind of kind of tying into that, so like, what do you, you know, you kind of alluded to it already, but like, what do you feel like is next for for slash boards um continue what we're doing i'm um, just keep building i mean three years in 30 plus clients i feel like we're we're at a good pace honestly um and we're doing it all independently and we're all and we're doing it as, as young like we neither one of us were at i mean i was at uta but i wasn't like an agent at uta like neither one of us came and did a decade at Wasserman and then, you know, when it started on shop, like we're doing this all, you know, on our own, you know, starting out, it's just us, you know? So I think just keep doing what we're doing. I think people rock with our ethos. I think that's one of the main reasons why people, you know, we've been able to sign the players that we have, um, especially like, you know, a lot of these dudes who were like, man, they were all world. Perry Jones, Isaiah Austin, those dudes were all world, you know, in high school and college too. You know, Isaiah should have been a pro um, in the NBA. But, you know, a lot of these guys, they were that. And then, you know, when that kind of subsides, the love ain't there as much from these other people. You know, the people where the love was there, it ain't there as much. And we still bring that love because, like I said, we basketball guys. So we respect the craft. We respect your talent. So we always going to show that love because we, we know who you are. And I think that's why a lot of dudes rock with us. And we're just going to continue to be that. I mean, we can only be us. And I think the more we just continue to improve as business people, we mature as men, mature as business people, you know, continue to understand what the agency is, how to service our clients, things like that. We're only going to get better. We're only going to grow. I mean, I feel like we have a bright future ahead of us. We have a long future ahead of us. We just getting started. You know, as this kind of pandemic has kind of hit, you know, I know you finished up at NYU and then you made that transition back over to the West Coast. You know, so like what are some things you've been really being able to kind of tap into professionally and personally um, during this time? Yeah, just um, tapping into myself. You know, I think that's something that a lot of people being locked in at the crib, they've been able to really have time to themselves and really like, you know, figure out who they are. Um, I've been reading a lot. I've never really been an avid reader, um, but you know, I would read, but it wasn't something like, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book a week type thing. So I really started to pick up books, all types of books, a lot of biographies, 
been reading this philosophy book um, called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Um, he, like that, just ex expanding my horizon, man, just really trying to understand myself, trying to better understand the world that we live in. Um, things like that. Yeah, just, man, just trying to become more enlightened. That's one thing that's really been something I've been focusing on lately. And then also working on some side projects. Um, so a good friend of mine, you know, do who, how we met Anthony at his pop-up, me and him been working on a project. Also got another project I'm working on um, myself, um, Dolo. So yeah, just using this, this extra free time to be able to do more things, you know, before, you know, you really locked, especially when I was in school, you know, you have more of a structured schedule. So now being out of school and then now pandemic, so I don't really have the extracurriculars that's pulling me away as well. It's like, man, I got mad free time. So it's now the ideas I had before, it's like put them into action, you know? So that's kind of something that I've really been trying to do and trying to stay locked in on even as the pandemic seems to be coming to a close maybe not coming to a close but you know <laughs> who knows but um yeah just still trying to stay locked in regardless of what you know the future situation is like um but yeah i think the pandemic you know it's it's definitely been something that was was trying to my mental state um but at the same time it's, it's been very beneficial and just like you know being one being one with myself and you know, taking some time to just, man, reset and learn some new shit, try something new. Yeah. Um, you sound like a a real LA dude coming in light. Those <laughs> <laughs> who don't know who's gonna watch this, my man is from Rancho Cucamonga. IE, let him know. IE, I'm not from LA, I'm from the Inland Empire. <laughs> and I've met two people who are from Rancho Cucamonga, you and my boy Owen. And I guess. Yeah on Friday, but uh, <laughs> that's dope as hell, man. Uh, my, my final question to you is, you know, is a little twist, like, you know, is there a music lyric or a movie line that you kind of like live by or any type of motto that, you know, really represents like what, what you've been up to? Um, man, I got, I got probably a hundred <laughs> Jay-Z that part I, I live by, but I would say one that immediately came to mind when you just asked that, Man, I'm trying to die enormous and live dormant. That's how we own it. Hey. Man, I would say, man, it's, 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 it's one of those. I'm just trying to the best I can be, you know, not even from like a monetary perspective, but like going back to what I said, man, impact, impact. You know, I'm just trying to leave an impact in whatever way I can, whether it's on my family, it's on my community. It's on my country, it's on the world at large, it's on culture, whatever it may be, whatever God, you know, whatever path he's laid out for myself. But impact is probably, you know, the word that is most important to me right now. But yeah, I'd rather die nervous than live dormant. That's how we own it. <laughs> whenever, I, whenever I ask that question, I always feel like a Jay-Z line is going to come out. Uh, yeah. Mine's a difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. So, yeah, you're both on the J shit, man. You've been in Brooklyn way too long. Uh, <laughs> man, it's on Mars. It's on Mars. <laughs> that energy flows through you when you're over there. <laughs> I feel you on that. Um, but do you have any final words as we, we kind of conclude this? Um, yeah, I mean, to anybody who, who who's watched this, um, man, all I can say is just continue to put the work in. Something that I've tried to tell myself every single day is that, you know, hard, hard work is going to be the, the difference maker at the end of the day. Like, when it comes to anything, it just depends on, it's like, like Kobe, I always go back to, it was, it was this, it's this Kobe story. When I was at Harvard's elite camp back in high school, a basketball elite camp, Jay Williams came and spoke, and he had this, this Kobe story, I guess. Um, he, he came, they was playing the Lakers, he went to go get some shots up before the game. Like, yo, I'm about, I'm in here two hours before. Like, he was thinking, like, I'm about to be ready, ready. Kobe was already in there. He was already in a full sweat, been in there for about 45 minutes. Jay went, man, worked out for like an hour or so. Hard workout. And he was thinking, all right, like, man, I'm putting in some work. Kobe was still working out. 
still working out, still going just as hard, grinding all that. Man, Jay was like, ain't no way, like, he about to go out. Like, this man just put in, like, a two-hour workout, going hard the whole time. We're about to play, you know. I don't know if they was on a back-to-back or what. He was just like, man, ain't no way. Kobe <laughs> K dropped, like, a 30-piece, 40-piece. And after the game, he asked Kobe, he was just like, man, like, why? Like, why? Basically, like, why? And he was just like, who do you want to be? And... Next to that hope lyric, I feel like that's my that's that the second thing that I always I always live. That might be the main thing. I should have said that. But who do you want to be? Right. I think down to it's like, man, who do you want to be? And depending on what that answer is, is going to depend on how much work you need to put in. Right. So I ask myself that all the time. I wrote that on my mirror when I was in college. So every single time I woke up in the morning, I looked, I saw, I was like, who do you want to be? Man, I want to be great. So I got to put in the work to be great. And I think that's one thing I think a lot of people should ask themselves every day. Like, who do you want to be? And let that be your God and light. I feel you on that, bro. That That's all I need to hear. I appreciate it, bro. Thank you for coming on Breaking Bread. You're my guy. I can't wait to link up back up to you in uh, Los Angeles. Appreciate you, my G.